Hey guys, in this video we're going to go through everything you need covering radioactivity for your edXL physics. If you want to make sure you've covered everything thoroughly, then you can get the free vision guide which is downloadable from our website. An atom is incredibly tiny. The word atom means uncuttable and it's so tiny that the Greeks who named it an atom thought it was the smallest thing. But it isn't the smallest thing. We know there are things inside of it. Now, I said it was incredibly tiny. Its size is 0.1 to 0.5 nanometers, which is 1 times 10 to the minus 10 to 5 times 10 to the minus 10 meters. Now, inside our atom, we have protons and neutrons, and in the shells on the outside, we have electrons. This bit in the middle here, this is called a nucleus. Protons and neutrons are located in the nucleus, whereas electrons in the outer shells. Protons have a mass of 1, neutrons have a mass of 1, and electrons are incredibly tiny. Their mass is 1 2 thousandths that of mass of a proton or a neutron. Protons have a charge of plus 1, neutrons have no overall charge, and electrons have a charge of minus 1. Here we have boron. The mass number is 11. The atomic number is 5. So if you want to find the number of neutrons, that is mass minus atomic, 11 minus 5 gives us 6, protons equal 5, electrons equal 5. Now protons have a positive charge, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, electrons have a negative charge, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So an atom, and this is for an atom only, will have the same number of positive charges and negative charges, which means there is going to be no overall charge in an atom. An iron is going to have lost or gained electrons. So, for example, if we have our, take our boron again, with our 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 positive and 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 negative charges, if it loses an electron, it now no longer has the same number of positive and negative charges, so it's going to be charged. It has created an ion. On the periodic table, you will see two numbers. The larger number of the two is the mass number. The smaller number of the two is the atomic number. It does not matter where these are located. Different um, books, exam boards are going to put these in different locations. It does not matter where these are located. The mass number is equal to the number of protons plus the number of neutrons. The atomic number is equal to the number of protons and also equal to the number of electrons in an atom. So if you want to find the number of protons, that is equal to the atomic number. Whereas if you want to find the number of neutrons, that is equal to the mass number minus the atomic number. There are three types of radiation. Alpha radiation, beta radiation, and gamma radiation. Alpha radiation is also known as a helium nuclei. Beta radiation is also known as an electron. And gamma radiation is part of the electromagnetic spectrum, it's a wave. A helium nuclear and alpha radiation can be rewritten as alpha 
for two, mass of two, positive charge of um, mass of four, positive charge of two. An electron can be written as E, mass of um, zero, charge of minus one. And gamma is again just a wave. Alpha radiation is very large, whereas gamma radiation is very small. Alpha radiation is highly ionising, whereas gamma radiation is not. Ionising means how good it is at knocking electrons off, so how good it is at turning something into an ion. Gamma radiation is highly penetrating, whereas alpha is not. To stop alpha radiation, a bit of paper or a bit of skin will do it. Aluminium foil or thin foil will stop beta radiation, but thick lead is needed to stop gamma radiation. A Gargamilla tube will measure radiation, it generally clicks every time it hears a bit of radiation. And the unit for radiation is the Becquerel. Here we have two isotopes of carbon. You can see they have the same atomic number, 6, but different mass numbers. Which means each of them is going to have 6 protons. They are each going to have 6 electrons. But when it comes to the mass number, one of them has 12 minus 6, 6 neutrons. And one of them has 14 minus 6, 8 neutrons. An isotope is an atom that has a different number of neutrons. You need to know all of the different sources of background radiation. Now the majority of background radiation comes from radon gas. This is about 50% and this picture here um, shows a beautiful scene from down in Cornwall, down in Devon because that area has a lot of radon gas going on. Then we have medical and about 14% comes from medical x-rays from different medical treatments such as x-rays or CT scans. Then we have stuff that comes up from the ground. This again is about 14%. Then we get slightly smaller and these are the sort of things that you really can't avoid because you do get some background radiation from food and drink and this is about 11.5%. Moving on to slightly smaller amounts now, cosmic radiation, radiation that we get from space, is going to be about 10%. Even smaller amounts now, from testing of nuclear weapons, it is going to be about 0.2%. From plane travel, and this obviously varies between person, because the more you travel on a plane, the more radiation you are going to be exposed to. And then the last one, we're all going to get a teeny tiny little dose from nuclear power stations. And those are your sources of background radiation. The model of the atom has changed a lot over time. And it's changed because we have new developments and new discoveries. From ancient Greece where they developed the word atom, uncuttable, to Dalton where it was a solid sphere. J.J. Thompson who discovered the electrons where we had a plum pudding model, a positive sphere with negative bits dotted through it. Rutherford, who did the plum pudding um, experiment and worked out that it had a solid centre. Bohr, who developed um, the nuclear model of the atom. Now I know the writing is very small on here, that's because you don't need to know the exact details, you just need to know the overall developments. Rutherford gave us the positive centre, which we call the nucleus. Chadwick added in neutrons, and then Bohr developed this nuclear model that we use today, with a positive centre and electrons orbiting outside. Rutherford wanted to test the plum pudding model, which was a large positive blob with negative bits dotted throughout it. So he took a sheet of gold foil and a gun that fired alpha particles and he shot them at the um, sheet of gold foil. Now the majority of these particles went straight through. But very occasionally one would get deflected. 
a little bit. And then even more occasionally, one would get deflected a lot. And this told Rutherford that instead of it being an evenly distributed um, pattern of negative and positive charges, we are likely to have an overall build-up of positive in the middle with negative charges around the outside so that the majority of the atom was made up of empty space and this led to the development of the nuclear model of the atom. Half-life is the time it takes for half the radioactive atoms to decay into something else. We can use that as a graph if we take 100% and 50% read across with a ruler and down 50% across through the ruler and down, and that there. The time between it having 100% activity and 50% activity, or whatever value and half of whatever that value is, is going to be the half-life. The half-life of something can range between very quick milliseconds to thousands, hundreds of years. The calculations for this are a lot simpler than they look. Here we have uranium-238, it is going to, going to get alpha to K. Alpha is 4, 2. So we have 2, 3, 8 minus 4 gives us 2, 3, 4. 92 minus 2 gives us 90. Then we need to use periodic table to look up what has an atomic number of 90. Giving us thorium. For beta decay, we have minus beta, 0, minus 1. 2, 3, 8 minus 0 gives us 2, 3, 8. 92 minus minus 1 gives us 93, which gives us Neptunium. It does not matter about the mass number for these calculations, the atomic number is the important thing. Different isotopes of an element are going to have different half-lives. The uses of radioactive antiquity are quite varied, and what tolls radioactivity you're going to use is going to depend on the half-life, and it is going to depend on the type of radiation. Gamma radiation can be used for cancer treatment and for sterilising materials because it is very good at killing cells. If it is going to be in a bit of medical equipment, we're going to need it to have a very long half-life. Beta radiation can't get very far, so it's just for things that need a short distance. For example, testing the thickness of foil that's being made or carpet, uh, cardboard that's being made. Uh, if too much beta radiation gets through, then we know it's too thin. If not enough gets through, then we know it's too thick. For this, we need a long half-life because it's within an industry. Whereas for a medical tracer, we don't want it to have a long half-life. We want it to get out of the body as quickly as possible. Alpha radiation is used in smoke alarms, and for this, again, we want it to have a long half-life. In nuclear fission, the breaking apart of atoms, we have a chain reaction. The first neutron is fired out of something, um, and it hits our heavy, heavy um, radioactive element, whether that's uranium or plutonium, and um, it doesn't really matter for this instance. It splits it, and we are going to get... The example would like you to draw three neutrons coming out, some neutrons coming out, some um, radiation coming out, and some smaller atoms. The neutrons that come out can then go on and hit other nuclei. So it keeps going, and every single um, reaction releases a neutron which can go on and hit something else, which is why it's called a chain reaction. These nuclei, once they hit, they break down into smaller nuclei, release neutrons, um, and radiation. Nuclear fusion is the process that takes place in our stars. It is going to be where nuclei fuse together to make one nuclei, one large nuclei. It's going to be combined with the release of energy, whether this is going to be light, heat or sound or all three in the case of our star.